G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Feels a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, do you guys ever experience stress or have anxiety, chronic pain, or have trouble sleeping at least once a week? Well, you're not alone, that's for sure. Many of us do. But personally, I struggle to get enough sleep at night and turn my mind off. And I was searching for anything that would help. Then I discovered Feels. Feels is a premium CBD delivered directly to your doorstep. Feels naturally helps reduce stress, anxiety, pain, and also sleeplessness. And now that I'm taking Feels, I am sleeping a lot better. All you have to do is place a few drops of Feels under your tongue and feel the difference within minutes. The thing to remember about CBD too is that finding your right dose is really important and everyone's dose is different, so leave room to experiment over the course of a week or so. You may need to take more or less to get the effects that you're after. Are you new to CBD? Well, Feels offers a free CBD hotline to help guide your personal experience, and Feels works naturally to help you feel better. There's no high hangover or addiction. You can also join the Feels community to get Feels delivered to your door every month. You'll save money on every order, and you can pause or cancel any time. Feels has me feeling my best every day, and it can help you too. Become a member today by going to feels.com slash scared, and you'll get 50% off your first order with free shipping. That's F-E-A-L-S dot com slash scared to become a member and get 50% off automatically taken off your first order with free shipping. Feels.com slash scared. Just to give some context, I'm currently in the UK and the town where I live is known for its drug scene, but it doesn't have a violent crime problem to speak of. And I think that's why I found what happened so shocking, because I lived in London before and while some messed up stuff did happen to me there, it was nowhere near on the level of what happened to me earlier this year. So my partner and I, we live together in our flat, which isn't a relatively busy residential area. I work from home, however, and he's out of the flat quite a lot, so I guess it might look to an outside observer like I live alone. Our flat complex was once an old factory, and we have these huge industrial windows, so people walking on the street have a pretty clear view of our dining room, which is where I work during the day. So it all started in July of this year. I'm ashamed to say that I can be a major rubbernecker and a lot of drama occurs on the road outside of our flat, so I look out of the windows often during my workday for some light entertainment. The best one was a two hour breakup that I got to watch unfold in a car just out below our window, but anyway, that's beside the point. One day I got up to make myself a cup of tea, looked out of the kitchen window and I saw this guy just staring at me. I was immediately struck by how intense it was and how he didn't look away too, even when it was obvious that I was looking back at him. I felt creeped out by it, but I tried not to let it bother me. Like I said, we have a lot of drug addicts and other weird characters that hang around here, so it didn't seem like a, a huge deal. I just went back to work and by the time that I'd sat down at the table, it was gone. Now, about a week later, I think, my partner had gone to visit his dad for the weekend, so I was excited to hunker down and catch up on some of my favorite shows alone. After about 30 minutes, the buzzer to the flat went. Now, the buzzer is so loud, and it scared the heck out of me when I heard it. In fact, I was lucky my popcorn didn't go flying out of my hands. But our flat complex has this big porch where teenagers and addicts love to hang out because it provides shelter from the rain and about four people can sit down inside of it. Sometimes people lean up on the buzzers by accident too when they're hanging out on this porch so I assumed it was just that. After a few seconds however the buzzer went again and again and again and someone was pressing it in this sort of rhythmic pattern. It's something that I know my partner does when he's forgotten his keys too and it's kind of our code for me to let him in, which is why I found it a, a bit disconcerting. At first, I was worried that he might have missed the bus to his dad's house and had decided to come back to the flat. I was nearly about to buzz him straight in too, and 
I thought that it would be a good idea to just pick up the phone first and check who it was, just in case. And as soon as I picked up that phone, the person standing near the intercom must have heard it, because they said hello, and it was definitely not my partner. I politely asked who it was and why they were buzzing the flat so late at night, but all they said was, can you let me in? I asked them what they wanted to come in for, and they said, you invited me, remember? While they were talking, they kept kind of laughing under their breath, and the whole exchange just really put me on edge. I told them that I had no idea who they were, and in the end, I just hung up. I was half expecting them to start pressing the buzzer again, too, but thankfully, they, they didn't. After a few minutes, I crept out of the flat to have a look at who was on the porch, but they were long gone. My partner has to get up early for work, whereas I'm more of a, a night out, to be honest. But most nights, I'm up until around 2 or 3 in the morning, working on my laptop while he's asleep. And a few nights after the intercom incident, I was on my laptop watching YouTube videos and realized that we'd forgotten to take the trash out. Now, this happens a lot, and it's not uncommon for me to take the trash out at around 1 or 2 in the morning. At least, it wasn't until this happened, that is. You see, I put my slippers on, grabbed the bag of trash, and took it out to the curb outside the flat's main entrance. When I looked across the street, there was this guy sort of standing on the opposite street corner. He was watching me, and his eyes followed me all the way from the front door to the curb. I noticed that he was smoking, so I assumed that he must have lived in one of the houses across the street, and I remember even thinking, wouldn't it be creepy if he tried to come over here? As I put the trash bag down, I got a glimpse of movement out of the corner of my eye. I looked up and saw him walking in a sort of straight line across the road towards me, with his eyes fixed on me the entire time. Now, I don't know how to describe it, but the look on his face filled me with this instinctive sense of dread. It felt like someone had just turned my stomach inside out. So, I pulled my keys out of my hoodie pocket, turned around and ran to the front door. I've never felt that kind of fear before too, and it was like my body was compelling me to get as far away from this guy as possible. Eventually, I got into the building, slammed the door behind me, and rushed to my flat without looking back. I didn't want to know whether he followed me or not. But I told my partner about the whole thing the next day and how shook up I was. We agreed that we'd be more proactive with the trash, and I've never taken it out late at night again. Fast forward to the beginning of August, about two weeks after the trash incident, and I'd pretty much forgotten about all of it. I was still too scared to go out late at night on the road, but nothing weird had happened since then. I went to bed at about two in the morning, but I felt restless for some reason and really struggled to get to sleep that night. By about three, I was contemplating whether or not to give up and just go and do something else, when I heard this scream and the sound cut right through me. There was something visceral about the terror in that scream. I knew instantly that it was bad because my partner went from stone cold asleep to being up in a shot and he asked me what it was and I said that I didn't know. I quickly went to the window straight away and looked out. Down one of the side roads near our flat I could see headlights but couldn't get a clear view of the car from where I was. The screaming continued in bursts, and after a while, I could sort of make out the words. It was a woman, and I think she was saying, get out, get out, over and over again. Like I said earlier, I'm used to hearing all kinds of domestic arguments take place on the road outside of our flat, particularly since we're near the university and several popular bars, but this, this was different. There was this raw fear in her voice that made the hairs on my arms stand up. I turned to my partner and said that, I had to call the police. When they picked up and I explained what was happening, they seemed disinterested at first, but the operator's tone changed when I told them where it was. I think they must have been getting calls from all around the area about it. It was sometime during this phone call, though, that I heard a screech of tires and the screaming stopped. The operator asked me to go to the window and describe to them what was happening. When I looked down, there was this black car sat on the road. One of the neighbors from across the road was speaking to the two guys in the car. 
I had to twist to get a good look at them, but one of the guys in the car looked uncannily like the guy who had been watching me when I was putting out the trash that night. At first, the conversation seemed cordial, but it took a turn when the neighbor asked them some sort of question that I couldn't hear clearly, and they quickly sped off down the road. And within no less than 10 minutes, three police cars arrived and had blocked off the roads leading to our flat. Our residential area is on a grid system. They were knocking on doors and asking to speak to all of our neighbors. I told my partner that we should go out and speak to them since we saw a lot of what happened. And my partner had had the foresight to write down the license plate of the black car too. When we went out, there were these two girls talking to one of the police officers they were both shaking and one of them looked as though she had been crying. I decided to try and stand nearby and wait for the girls to finish before speaking with the officer myself. And what they said made my blood run cold. So they were from one of the houses that looked out directly onto the road where I had seen the headlights. They had a clear view of what had happened. And like us, they had been alerted by the screaming and had gone straight to the window. From what they could gather... The black car had cut off a small red car on the road, like pulled right in front of it, and that's what had caused the girl driving the red car to scream the first time. They thought that it might have been some kind of a misunderstanding, but then they watched as one of the guys from the black car got out, walked to the red car, and jumped in through the window. That's the point when the girl must have been screaming, get out, get out. There had been some sort of a struggle, and the girls watching said that they assumed the guy was just trying to steal the car, but... Then he forced the driver into the back seat, and that was when he drove off. The two girls were both hysterical by this point, and you could tell that they felt guilty for not intervening. I could feel that same guilt beginning to seep into my own thoughts as well. After the guy had driven off in the car, the two men in the black car had gone the opposite way and turned the corner onto our road, but had been stopped by another neighbor. Although this neighbor had been alerted by the screaming, he didn't actually witness what had happened, so he had stopped the black car to ask the guys what was going on without knowing that they were involved. And that was the exchange that we saw. When the guys started acting suspicious, he asked them if they would wait for the police to arrive, and that was the point that they drove off. It wasn't until we got back to the flat that I think I started to put two and two together. You see... I have a small red car, just like the one that the girls had described, and I normally come back at night on that day of the week, since it's the day that I go to visit my parents. I had only come back earlier on this particular occasion because I needed to let a plumber in to do some work on the flat. So, what if they had been waiting for me and they just got the wrong car? Over the next few days, I contacted the police several times and checked the local news, but I never heard anything about the girl who was kidnapped. I still have no idea what happened to her. All I do know is that they found her car abandoned somewhere not far from where she was taken, but she wasn't in it. Back in undergrad, two of my friends from Res and I, well, we moved into the second floor of a triplex located just outside of downtown where our school is located. Our neighbors downstairs were girls that we knew from the Res and upstairs were upper year guys that also went to our school. And one day, my roommate Elle and I were sitting in the living room when Angie, our other roommate, comes home and tries to open the door. The house was laid out, so you sort of enter right into the living room, but our couch was sitting in a sort of nook facing perpendicular to the front door, so you couldn't really see us sitting there. Angie knocks and yells at us to open the door for her because she could see the lights were on. I go to let her in and she asks, Hey, uh, do you guys always lock the door when you're home? Ellie and I just sort of looked at each other with a like, What the heck? Duh. And explained to her that... We lived in the middle of a city, and of course we always locked the door. Maybe it was a, a cultural difference or something, since Elle and I grew up in the same large suburb, and Angie was from a very small town in France where it was probably safer or something. Now, it's definitely safe where we live, don't get me wrong, but it's a busy area, and, well, you just never know, right? However, even after we told her to always keep the door locked, Angie 
apparently kept leaving the door unlocked when she was home. A few days later to uh, get home, unlock the door and go inside. I met with Angie yelling, asking if it's me or Elle who's home. And she tells me that before I got home, when it was still light out, she was sitting on the couch and someone opened the door, but nobody came in. And since she couldn't see the door from the couch, it felt weird. She said hello, and the person at the door waited a moment, and a man said, Sorry, uh, wrong house, and quickly left. Now, it was definitely not our neighbors, and it's difficult to get the wrong house when you have to climb a steep flight of stairs like that. I've also heard of burglars just trying every door, so that might have been the case, but... Are they stupid enough to do that in broad daylight? Anyways, Angie these days, she always locks the doors and for that, I'm grateful. This was a few years back, but I want to share this experience with you guys. First, I would like to say that no, I'm not a grave robber, nor am I a pervert or anything like that. But I was a construction worker back then, and we had to replace an old connector water pipe from a great church in our city with a new one. Around the church, there was a, a lot of green lawn, which, as we we're about to learn, was allegedly used as a graveyard for the richer citizens from like 1100 up to 1800. But the thing is, though, is that the ground there is very clay-like, which brings the dissolving of a human skeleton to a halt. This mixed with the old grave digging habits from the people back then led to our excavator digging out lots and lots of human bones as soon as it got deeper than one meter that is. It was pretty awkward as our instruction team was just standing there staring while the excavator unearthed whole skeletons and then cut them in half because in real life the bones aren't still connected like they are in the cartoons and such. And I, as the trainee back then, got the unfortunate job to pick the bones from the earth pile the excavator created while my three co-workers just stood there refusing to even touch anything. I stood there wearing gloves, taking up bones and complete skulls sometimes, brushing them off more or less clean and collecting them on a piece of cardboard until the archaeologists showed up on the site. They took photos and told us some facts of when the place was a graveyard before taking off again. After the work was done, we threw everything back in before the holes got filled up. Now, the thing about this whole experience, though, was that as soon as I started working at the bones, I just felt like I was being watched all of a sudden. Not by my colleagues, too, but by something else. At some point, too, I was even able to see something, but only from the corner of my eye. At one point, too, I saw two people standing right next to the hole, just watching as I did my thing, but as soon as I turned my head, whoever was there just disappeared. At first, I could have sworn they seemed to be upset. At gestures, I, I didn't quite see them, like I said, but I sort of thought that I saw them, but as they seemed to notice that I was very caring and respectful with the remnants, they just sort of stood there watching me. After that, they disappeared, but I saw them again. You see, they reappeared in the same style on the always free back seats of our car as we headed back to the department. Apparently, I was the only one seeing them, but my co-workers were a little bit creeped out by the fact that I touched human bones without hesitating like that. Thankfully, whatever this was stopped after I prayed for them later on, but... It was a, a fun job, I'm not going to lie, but man, it was a weird experience, let me tell you. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and before we continue, I would like to just give Honey a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, we all shop online and we've all seen that promo code field that taunts us at the checkout, but thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free browser extension that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Honey supports over 30,000 stores online. They range from sites that have tech and gaming products to popular fashion brands and even food delivery. So imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. When you check out, the Honey button drops down and all you have to do is click Apply Coupons. 
Wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. If Honey finds a working coupon, you watch the prices just drop. In fact, I use online shopping for just about everything these days because, well, I love the convenience. And just the other day, I ordered pizza for some friends I had over and thought, you know what, well, what the heck, I'll check and see if I can save some money through Honey. And what do you know, I saved $30 with just a few clicks. And Honey has an impressive record of finding over 17 million members over $2 billion worth in savings. So if you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on free savings. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds, and by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash scared. That's joinhoney.com slash scared. Me and some of my buddies used to go to this place called Profile Rock in Freetown, Massachusetts, late at night sometime around 2 or 3 in the morning, I suppose. One night during the summer, I go to Profile Rock with three of my friends at 2.30 in the morning, just to mess about and explore and whatnot. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but Profile Rock in the area that we were in is a part of an area called the Bridgewater Triangle, which is a site of alleged paranormal activity, and also one of the most haunted areas in the state that I live in. But continuing on, we climbed Profile Rock itself, stayed on top of it for maybe three or four hours, and we all decided to leave at that point. As you're leaving Profile Rock though, you have to go down this really long path that's about two miles long to get back to where we parked our car. Two of my friends are walking maybe 20 or 30 feet in front of me, and my other friend. I'll never know why I turned around too, but I didn't have a feeling like someone was watching us or anything like that. I just simply turned around because besides the moonlight shining through the trees in certain areas, we only really had cell phone flashlights to make our way around. But I remember turning around and seeing someone running at us from like 150 feet away full speed. But what completely threw me off wasn't that they were running at us, it's how they were running. You know how a zombie walks in a sort of horror movie dragging one of its legs almost limping? That's how this someone was running at us. At first I didn't say anything too and possibly assumed it was one of my friends or someone that was already in there who got injured and needed assistance or something. Until this someone made it to an area of the path where the moonlight reached through the trees and gave them some perspective. And what I saw, it still chokes me up till this day. Have you ever seen a child sort of draw a person? How they make a stick figure most of the time? Well, that's exactly how this someone looked. I caught maybe a, a 10 second glance as it was running under the moonlight lit trees, but I saw no distinguishable facial features. No eyes, no mouth, and no ears. Its arms and legs looked like that of an extremely malnourished person, only completely black. And it didn't look like skin or any type of clothing from what I could see. I almost can't even describe it to be honest. And you could blatantly tell that it wasn't a mask or one of those Halloween blacked out suits or anything. But I recall calling out to my friend in a sort of panicked voice who was walking with me. And was now maybe 10 feet ahead of myself. I shined my cell phone light on him as he was looking where I was just looking. And I could tell right away from his facial expression that I wasn't just seeing things. It was now maybe 40 feet away from us, if that, almost the same distance as our friends in front of us, and me and my friend, we just took flight and we started running with everything that we had. My two other friends in front of us shot around and asked us what was wrong, and I replied, just run, and all four of us just jetted out for the car. I remember taking a glance back as we were running, and when I did, there was nothing there. Even though whatever was chasing us would certainly be on our tails by now. Well, I didn't ask questions. We all hopped in the car and my friend who was walking with me yells, Dude, tell me that you just saw that. What was that? I told him that I think I saw the same thing and I asked him to describe to all of us what he saw and he described literally the exact same thing that I witnessed. But by now... The other two friends are thinking that we were joking around or messing with them or something. And to my friend who was walking with me, swore on his father who had passed away not even a month ago that he was telling the truth. I was kind of frustrated to be honest because I couldn't believe my other two friends didn't see it as they turned around to question why we were running. But 
Anyway, I guess that doesn't really matter. What matters is that we got back there safely, and we actually went back there with a few more people the day after and witnessed nothing, of course. And I guess that I'll just never know what it was, or who it was, or what it wanted. But what I do know is one thing. There is no way that two people both just imagine seeing some stick figure spectre in the woods like that. So, this started two nights ago, and I'm hoping that someone can give me a guess as to what could be going on. Note, too, that I do have nyctophobia, though outside at night doesn't bother me like the inside of a dark house or room due to childhood trauma, which I won't go into. So, on one side of the room I have white Christmas lights dimmed down a bit for some light at night. Luckily, that doesn't bother my fiancé, but he could sleep upside down in a hurricane, to be honest, so it's easy going. And two nights ago, I woke up in the middle of the night and went to the bathroom. I couldn't get back to sleep afterwards. I have bad insomnia too. So I was just sort of laying in bed, bored, debating on just staying up all night, but was pretty much just staring at the ceiling, just chilling and waiting to get tired again. When all of a sudden, it was like... Every sense that I had yelled danger. I mean, the hair on my body stood up, goosebumps all over. I was overwhelmed with complete fear. I, I can't exactly describe the feeling, but if you guys have ever been put in a dangerous situation, then you might be able to relate. Anyway, this is where things get a bit weird and confusing, to be honest. So, there was a figure in the doorway, except I couldn't really see it clearly. It's hard to explain, but my senses were telling me, hey, there's something there, but my eyes just couldn't really make it out. I could follow it with my eyes, I could sense it, but I couldn't exactly see what it was. It's hard to explain, but whatever this thing was, it wasn't like a solid shadow, it wasn't like humanoid in shape, that I could tell anyway. It was like a, a mist or smoke, but not dark. Tall and kind of shaped like if someone had a sheet over themselves and just stood there. That kind of shape. Yeah, I know that it doesn't really make that much sense because, like I said, it was hard to see, but it was almost like I knew that it was there, but it was possibly camouflaging itself or something. Again, I'm sorry, but it's just hard to explain. Anyway, moving on from that, it went from the doorway to the other side of the room at the end of the bed. It didn't walk, it was more like it teleported, to be honest. It sort of jumped from place to place, Meanwhile, every part of me is telling me to run in danger, but then I see it go from the end of the bed to my side of the bed, and at this point, I sit up and my senses are going completely nuts. I can and cannot see whatever this thing is. It's sort of moving out of my peripheral vision and sort of in and out of focus. It moves to the end of my bed directly in front of me, and my instinct is saying danger again, and every part of me is telling me to move and move now. Well, I didn't because... As I said, I, I could see it, but not see it at the same time. So, going from my eyes, I thought maybe I was just kind of overreacting or something. Maybe I was hallucinating. Maybe I wasn't really seeing anything at all. I don't know, but a few seconds later, it lurches at me. The best way I can describe it is, it just sort of jumped at me. I couldn't yell. I tried. I was shoved back onto the bed, and the feeling was a mix of sort of static and electrical shock. Think if you sort of held onto a livestock electric fence for a few seconds or something like that, over my entire body. I managed to throw my arm out, smacking my fiancé and grabbing his chest, basically grabbing onto him for dear life. He jumps up absolutely confused and half asleep. He sees me basically scared out of my mind, and this thing just fades away. Yeah. I couldn't talk for a while, but I could move. I explained to him what happened, and he just hugged me until I was able to fall asleep again. And last night, I had a similar thing happen again. But this time, I tried to really focus on whatever it was with my eyes, because once that feeling came over me, I, I just knew that it was coming, and I can't really do anything about it. But this time I focused, and it went to the top left corner of the bedroom, and it was more shadowy this time, if that's the right word. It darkened that corner of the room is what I mean, which isn't too far from the end of my side of the bed. 
I sat up ready for something to happen, and it again jumped on or sort of in me. I don't know how to explain it, but I managed to grab my fiancé who was already awake. It still scared the heck out of him, though, but he didn't see anything, and I was alert and awake but wasn't talking, and the electrical weird feeling in my body lasted a while before fading this time. But it didn't move like the night before. It was basically at the doorway, corner of the ceiling, then bam, it was right in front of me. It happened really quickly too, whereas the night before it, it was like it was trying to figure out what to do maybe, or observing before jumping on me. Not sure, but it was definitely quicker this time. Now, after doing some research, I used some sage smudge before bed because I was worried and clearly it didn't help. I've had experiences of the paranormal before growing up in a haunted house, and yes, I believe in ghosts and all that. I've been told by a few people that due to things that have happened and continue to happen that there's a chance that I'm possessed, or at least I have an evil something attached to me, which wouldn't surprise me at all. I also have nightmares every night, and it's been like this for, well, years. But... This, whatever this thing is, it's new and it's really terrifying and I have no idea what to do from here. Do any of you guys have any suggestions? Also, I'm sorry, I know that this story is a bit confusing and all over the place, but my fiancé is very supportive and he also believes in the paranormal, which I'm thankful for. I'm really not sure what's going on, but I'm really scared to... Go to bed tonight. So this happened this week. I'm a 25 year old female and a single mum. We had a, a guy quit earlier this week and we thought that he skipped town. But this guy too just always gave me the creeps. He was at least 59 to 63. I never really took the time to find out but... For a bit more of a backstory, I'm open about being a true crime fan. I listen to true crime podcasts regularly at work. And well, one day, he told me to look up a more current missing woman's case. She was a, a mum with brown hair and brown eyes, like me. And she went missing right before he moved to my town. And now, I really hope that I'm just overthinking this, but... Last night, my mum took my son for the night, and this guy knew that I was alone on Thursday nights due to a small talk in the office. As I was closing my curtains due to it getting dark, and you can see clearly into my house, I saw this van down the street. Upon seeing it, I locked the doors, and I also had my gun with me on my chair just watching TV. Now, this is a small town that I live in, so my friends and family will stop over randomly, but they never knock. So, when I heard a knock at the door, I loaded my gun and looked out the window for a vehicle, but there was nothing. Whiskey, my dog, started growling, which he never growls, barks a little bit. He's a little dog, but I've never heard him growl before. Something just wasn't right. Even though my ex-husband taught me all sorts of self-defense too, I called the police and with snow on the ground... There were footprints going all around my house, and he also left the gate open. I haven't heard from the police if they found him yet. I lock my doors more often now and have friends and family call before they come over too, but it was a really creepy night, and whoever that was, I just hope that it wasn't him. This happened to me and my friends a couple of years ago. So, my mum used to work at this pretty creepy church a long time ago, along with a couple of my friend's parents. While my mum and my friend's parents were doing work, me and my friends would just do whatever, play hide and seek, or just explore since it was a pretty big church. Anyway, one day me and my friends were playing in this big area towards the back of the church where no one really goes unless they need to, so we figured that we could be as loud as we wanted to back there. While me and my friends were running around, one of my friends decided that he wanted us to go and see what was at the bottom of this stairwell towards the far left of this big area. Our parents always told us not to go down there, but out of curiosity it got the better of us and we decided to see what was at the bottom. We were at the top of the stairs just sort of looking down 
deciding if we should still go down there or not. And with a lot of persuading from one of my friends, we all eventually decided to go down and not tell anyone. When we got down there, it was honestly like a giant maze. I mean like thousands of narrow hallways, rooms on both sides of us. It was so narrow too that we had to go single file down these hallways. I was second in line most of the time anyway. Yeah, we must have walked for probably two or three hallways when we suddenly heard a loud noise. Then all went quiet and we thought that it was probably just mice or something like that in one of the rooms but we were still a little bit scared and creeped out by the noise since there was only one entrance and exit and we came down that way. We were taking our time going forward when all of a sudden a lady with grey hair came around the corner and just grinned at one of my friends. We all just sort of stood there in fear for a second then my fight or flight response kicked in and we all were tumbling over each other trying to get out of there. Since it was so narrow and we had to go single file, I could only go as fast as I could, so I started to push my friend and say go faster, but we finally got out of there and when we looked back, there was no lady anywhere. Later my friend told me that when he looked back, she was still following them but was just walking and sort of grinning at us. He also told us that he saw a door behind the lady, but I guess we were just so fixated on this lady and in shock that we didn't notice it. Another thing that we learn later on too is that there should have been no one down there at that time. I'm a single mother to an obnoxiously adorable seven-year-old boy. This happened when he was five years old in the summer of 2018 and the what-ifs still haunt me. So, there's a beautiful park on the river that my son and I used to frequent. On this summer evening, we decided to picnic in the park for dinner. When we arrived, there were lots of families playing with their children on the playground. We found a spot in the grass near the water, laid down our big purple blanket and began to eat. I was facing the playground, just people watching, when I noticed a group of three children that seemed to be alone. There were two boys and one girl, and they looked to be between the ages of maybe 9 and 12. And you know that bad feeling that you get when something just doesn't feel right? These kids, for some reason, just gave me that feeling almost instantly. I brushed it off, though, because, well, they were only kids, right? My son and I were almost done eating and ready to play when some dark clouds came rolling in. We live in Florida and this is standard for a summer evening so I decided to wait it out and see if it would pass. It did. Everyone cleared the park with the exception of the group of children that I mentioned before and it was at this point that I realized that they were definitely alone. I figured that they must live nearby or something. Either way I took my son on the swing and these kids were just sort of hanging around near us and staring but not saying anything. Then the youngest looking boy came up to my son on the swing and stood in front of it so that my son almost hit him while he was swinging. He just stood there. I asked him what he was doing and he didn't answer. It made me super uneasy so I took my son off the swing and over to the jungle gym on the other side of the playground. My son and I were playing on the other side of the park and I didn't see the other kids anymore so I thought they must have left. I sat down on the bench near the jungle gym and watched my son as he played. About 10 minutes later I looked over toward the parking lot and noticed the same group of kids were actually still at the park and were over there talking to an older man with a dog. This went on for another 5 or so minutes and then the man and the children parted ways. The man walked down the street the opposite direction and the children came back to the park and over to the jungle gym where my son was playing. I was still sitting on the bench which was probably no more than about 10 feet away from the jungle gym when these kids started hanging around and talking to my son. They were asking him a lot of questions too like how old are you, or where do you go to school, stuff like that. He was answering while climbing around and didn't seem to be paying a whole lot of attention. I was watching the other kids the entire time this was going on because they just gave me an unwavering bad feeling. And after a few minutes, they got off the jungle gym and began walking toward the road. I was so fixated on the top of their heads too as they were walking away that 
I didn't realize at first my son, who was tiny, was walking with them. They were almost to the street when I screamed my son's name, then he turned around and bolted back to me. I asked him where he was going and he said they said that they had to show me something. Well, we left immediately after that. To this day, I really don't know if it was sinister or not, but I can't explain the kids trying to lead my son out of the park and I often think about what could have happened if I wasn't paying attention that day. It was the old man somehow involved? I spoke with my son about following the stranger danger rule with anyone that he doesn't know, even if they're kids like him. And after that, we didn't play at that park anymore. Sometimes too, I, I drive by that park on occasion and I've even seen that old man a few times, but I've never seen those children since that day. There was one time about maybe two or three years ago now when I was in the woods camping with my brother and we had just gotten there at around 4pm to set up and everything. Once we had everything set up we got a fire going and then when we got the fire going I told my brother that I was going to go and get some firewood because we only had enough to start the fire. So I went out and it was around 7 I guess and then I just suddenly all of a sudden got really cold even though the weather was not cold at all. And I got this sudden rush of coldness too. I felt a heavy feeling of just pure evil and hatred and despair and I immediately went back to my brother. He told me that it was fine and that it was probably just a, a strong thing of wind that made me cold or something but I knew then that something was definitely wrong. Anyway, we sat around the fire and I just felt like someone or something was watching me the whole night. Once again, I started to feel that same feeling of evil and all that stuff faintly. It slowly started getting worse and worse, as if it was sort of growing inside of me, but I brushed it off as just my mind playing tricks on me, and I went to bed. But at around 2.20ish in the morning, I heard something that sounded like a scream, and it actually woke me up. I immediately looked around the tent and got a flashlight. When I turned the light on, I noticed that my arm was bleeding, and had been cut open by something in like multiple spots. I woke my brother up in a bit of a panic and told him what happened. He said that he didn't know what I was talking about and my arm was not even cut, even though I was looking right at it and it was obviously cut open and bleeding. I said, are you joking? And he continued to say that nothing happened to me and I was pranking him. It was around that time too that I felt a huge amount of pain in my arm and then I heard the scream again, but it didn't sound like how a human screams. It was more of a, a screech, like there was an animal or some sort of a creature in the distance that was in pain. I looked at my brother and asked if he heard it, and he said, What do you mean? Did I hear what? And nothing happened. At that point, I was pretty terrified. I was praying that nothing would happen for the rest of the night too, but after a few minutes, I heard that scream again and every time the thing screamed I would feel that feeling again and my arm would start to have a sort of burning sensation all over it. Eventually though all of it stopped thankfully although after that I obviously wasn't able to sleep for the rest of the night but the next morning I told my brother that I wanted to leave ASAP. We packed up and when we went to get back into the truck I could have sworn too that out of the corner of my eye I saw something run through the woods. We got to the truck and I looked to the right while packing some stuff up and four of the trees had marks like they'd been clawed by some sort of a huge maybe bear or something. But the thing was is that the marks were like at least 12 feet up the trees, maybe even higher. At that point though I was just so tired and scared that I just got back in the truck and we left. To this day, I still haven't gone camping again, and I wonder a lot just what it all was about. So, do you guys have any idea on what it was? Also, just to clear some things up, no, I don't take any drugs. No, I don't have any mental health problems as far as I know. No, I've never hallucinated before, and I just have no idea why this happened.
This is a series of events that happened from when I was like 4 to 12. When I was younger, we weren't able to afford our own apartment, so we had to rent a room. But my stepdad had a friend that offered to help. It was me, my two siblings, and my mother and stepfather. The guy's name was Diego, and he lived with his family. At first, we lived in his garage, before moving into a sort of tiny room. I didn't know exactly why at the time, but Diego got a divorce from his wife, and she kicked him out. This was around the time that I was four, and my stepdad offered to rent out to Diego, as we were in the process of finally moving into our own apartment, too. So we moved in and all was well. Diego brought his son, whose name was Valentine, and they rarely let us in their room. For all we know, they pretty much didn't exist, to be honest. But then, out of the blue, they had a puppy. For whatever reason, they never let us play with it. We didn't mind it, really, since well, we couldn't care less, but then the dog went missing. Well, so we were told, anyway. D and V, Diego and Valentine, didn't seem to care, and... Again, they got another puppy. We didn't think too much of it at the time, I suppose. I mean, we didn't care that much, but it was a bit weird. But one day, my mum goes in to speak with them about something mundane, and she was shocked to see an altar to some foreign god or something. We eventually found out that it was a notorious saint of death that the Mexican cartel pray to, and it turns out we now understood exactly why the puppies were going missing. My mum was completely terrified and told my stepdad who then kicked them out. But they moved out a few apartments down and I remember V would always taunt me with knives whenever I saw him after that. I also have some other stories of Valentine but I might save those for another time. But anyway, me and my sister moved into the room and never really cared because we didn't know what was going on at the time. But one night, me and my sister were watching Family Guy when we heard scratching on the window. This was one of those slide windows that went to the backyard in which there was a fence that overlooked the back of the apartments onto a sidewalk. We looked, and that's when we both saw what we could have sworn was like a werewolf-looking creature with yellow eyes just staring at us. At first, I thought that it wasn't real, to be honest, but... Then it turned really quickly and slammed the backyard door closed, causing the whole fence to shake. And from that day to the day that I moved from that place, the fence was always bent in a way that seemed like it was pulled outward, like a ramp almost. My apartment building was just one block with four apartments that were all vacant, so we were pretty much all alone. I actually couldn't believe what I saw too, so I asked my sister and she said that she saw the same thing. We told my mum and we switched rooms and now my stepdad was sleeping in the room alone. Another night, me and my sister were getting ready to sleep when the window started banging like if multiple people were hitting it at once. Again, we told our mum but there was nothing else that she could really do. There are other times that things have happened as well. Like, we used to have this stuffed wired doll that had sort of praying hands, and one night, my stepdad heard this noise and went to find out what was going on, and he found it in the bathroom with its head in the toilet like something invisible was drowning it. He grabbed it since it wasn't scared easily, and he found that it had no batteries in it, which was weird because that whole praying motion only occurred when you turned a switch on and there were batteries in it. So how it got to that position, I have no idea, and how it got in the bathroom like that, we're all still perplexed by it. But my last story, even though there's far more things that happened, was that one day we walked to the store as a full family. The walk was around three to five minutes as we went to and from a local 7-Eleven that was basically in our backyard pretty much. And when we got back, I kid you not that everything in the house was thrown over. I mean, the TV, the TV stand, every framed picture, basically just everything was thrown all over the floor. It was honestly as if there was like a small earthquake that only took place in that house at that time. It was weird walking into that, and it's something that I'll never forget. But we still stayed there because, well, we couldn't afford a new place. But we did everything that we could to stop this stuff from happening. Things did cool down eventually, but... Not all the way, that's for sure. 
And it wasn't until like eight full years later when we finally moved that we realized that it wasn't just the house that was haunted. Things followed us or something to our new home, but we rarely ever encountered anything after that. The only thing that really happens these days are nightmares that we have once in a while that are pretty vivid, but that's about it. To this day too, I'm 17 years old now, I still have nightmares and dreams about that old home from time to time. And as crazy as it may sound, I actually sort of miss that old home, and plan to visit sometime soon too, as that's where I was raised and had some of the best moments in my life too. Every once in a while though, I dream of someone being in my room in the dark, waiting for me to get up, only to get stabbed in the same place on my stomach. I always wake up with a sort of weird pain as if I sprinted a mile after drinking a gallon of water without stretching. I'm not sure if you understand what I mean, but it's a bit weird, let's just say that. Anyway, like I said, there's a lot more to these stories than just what's here, but I'll leave it here for now, and thanks for listening. This is a story about a co-worker that I had a really long time ago. To give some context to, every summer I would do some temp work for the company where my dad worked. It was an education company, so they always needed temp workers around July or August time for all of the exam remarks that they had come in. It was data entry work basically, but it suited me fine and it meant that I could earn a little extra cash while I was still at university. I did this every summer from when I was about 19 right through to when I was 23 and then I got another job at the same company for a bit after I graduated but we'll get to that later. For now all you need to know is that I was a reasonably familiar face there and everyone knew that I was my dad's daughter. So the main downside of working at a place like this was that I'd clock off at work at 5pm but I'd have to wait for my dad to finish work since he was the head of an entire department, so he'd end up staying a bit later often. Every day, I would bring my book with me and sit in these little foyer areas between his department and the department where I worked, since it had the most comfortable chairs. I must have been 22 years old when this happened too, because it was the penultimate summer that I worked there. I just had my hair cut short for the first time in my life, and I had it dyed red as well. So... I was just sitting on these couches reading when all of a sudden this guy approaches me. Leon tells me that he works in my dad's department and that he thought that he would introduce himself. This was a pretty common occurrence for me and I was already aware of this guy too. He was young and decent looking so a few of the women in my department had a bit of a crush on him. I was dating someone at the time though and although I had never actually seen him in person I could see what they saw in him. We got to chatting and he mentioned that I'd changed my hair so I told him about cutting it short and he sort of cut me off mid-sentence and this is where it started getting a, a little bit weird. He said to me, no first it was brown and you didn't have a fringe, then you went through that phase of curling it, then you put the fringe in it and dyed it red, after that you dyed it purple and now you've cut it short and dyed it back to red. This guy I had just met was describing like over two years worth of hairstyles that I had had and I felt a bit creeped out by it I'll admit but he seemed like a nice enough guy and I guess I had worked at the company throughout that entire time so it was sort of reasonable to assume that he maybe had noticed me before. Either way that should have been the first red flag for sure. He asked me if I had Facebook and I told him that I did so he said that he would add me. That seemed pretty normal too but then after he'd sent the friend request he asked me to get my phone out so he could watch me accept the friend request. I'm British and it's therefore impossible for me to be impolite so I got my phone out and showed him that I had accepted it. I thought that that would maybe calm him down. Bear in mind, he wasn't a bad looking guy, so I felt a bit flattered at this point that he was so keen on me. That sense of flattery dissolved real quick. So after the Facebook thing, he kept asking me if I had MSN and I told him that I didn't. I swear too that throughout this conversation, he must have asked me if I had MSN about four times. Then, the final time that he asked, he was like, please can you get MSN so we can chat after work? 
And the way that he said it was like he had something really urgent that he wanted to tell me, but I, I only just met this person, so... I kind of laughed and said about how I hadn't used MSN since I was like a teenager without necessarily rejecting him. Then he said something like, well, if you don't have MSN, then do you have Skype? This seemed like the perfect opportunity to bring up my boyfriend too, who was a foreign student and went back to his home country during the summer. He was the only person that I spoke to on Skype. I said to Leon about how I didn't have my own Skype account, but I used my dad's account to talk to my boyfriend. I really thought that this might ward him off too, but I was wrong again. Without missing a beat, he said, can you please get your own Skype account so we can video chat after work? And this time, he said it like I was somehow inconveniencing him, like this was something we'd agreed to do months ago or something. I honestly had no idea how to react, so I just sort of smiled and, and laughed. Thank the heavens, too, that someone from my dad's department walked past at that moment and was like, Leon, aren't you meant to be at your work desk? He scurried off pretty quick after that, but not before reminding me to get my own Skype account and send him the details. I told my dad about the whole exchange in the car ride home, but all he said was that Leon was very friendly and that a lot of the women in his department liked him, so maybe I just misunderstood the situation... I thought that he was probably right, so I tried to not let it bother me. Later that evening, however, I was on my computer doing university work when a message popped up on my Facebook. It was Leon. All the message said was, well, we like the same movies. I don't know what it was too, but something about this message just freaked me out a lot. I decided not to respond and logged off Facebook hoping that he wouldn't notice that I'd been online. The next day after work, I was sat at my usual spot when Leon comes over to me. His face, though, was like thunder. At first, I thought that he was just having a bad day and was walking through the hallway, but my heart dropped when I realized that he was walking directly towards me. Why didn't you respond to me on Facebook message? I was stunned, to say the least. How was I supposed to respond to that? Who says stuff like that in real life? Lucky for me, I didn't have an opportunity to respond because he started off on this tirade. I'm not even kidding. He started listing all of the movies that we had in common that he had seen on my Facebook profile. Batman, The Dark Knight, Watchmen, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, Fight Club. I just sat there watching him reel off all of these film titles. But once he was finished, all he said was, It's okay. I forgive you and then just walked off back to his department. Over the next couple of weeks, he came and found me in my spot every day and talked at me from the moment that I sat down to pretty much the moment that my dad came to get me. I don't remember many of the other exchanges, but I do remember distinctly one day pretending to pick my nose when I saw him coming to see if that would put him off, and it didn't. It got to the point where I'd get so stressed out after work that I'd go and hide in the toilets for as long as I could, but the women that I worked with started to notice and think that I was weird. Eventually, I breached the subject with my dad again, and he gave me his car keys after my shift so that I could just go and hide out in his car rather than in the building. So I camped out in his car, and I'm still feeling quite tense, but after about 20 minutes, I start to feel at ease. I mean, surely he won't come looking for me out here, right? wrong. I look over at the main entrance and my heart drops. He's coming out of the door and he's scrutinizing all of the cars. I sort of sank down as far as possible into my seat but I wasn't fast enough and he saw me. He comes rushing off and starts tapping on the glass so I open the door and ask him what's up. I didn't see you in your usual spot but luckily James, he's the doorman, told me that he saw you come out here. Why are you in your dad's car? Again, what are you supposed to say to that? I told him that I had a headache, so I thought that I would come out to the car to take some paracetamol and see if I could get some sleep. At least he respected that because he told me to feel better and then left me alone. I breathed a sigh of relief, knowing that I was only going to be working there for a few more days before I had to go back to university. 
I told my dad about the car incident, and after this, he gave Leon a talking to the next day. Leon would still come and find me in the foyer, but he'd only talk to me for a few minutes in passing before leaving me alone. And man, it was a huge relief. On my last day at work there, I was fully expecting him to do something crazy, but he didn't even come to chat with me that day. I left the office and thought that I honestly would never see him again. And I found out that he was fired not long after I left the company that year because he kept coming into work late and then spent most of his time at work chatting with his co-workers and me apparently. Anyway, fast forward to January of 2014 and I was preparing to move to China for a position teaching English. I graduated from university and I was working at the same company but this time in a sort of semi-permanent capacity. It was my last day at work so I received quite a few gifts and some fuss from my co-workers. It was about 10 a.m. when who should I see walk through the door but Leon. He had been hired as a temp to do the job that I had done for so many years and as soon as he walked through that door he saw me and this flash of recognition crossed his face. I just wanted to slide under my desk and die at this point. But he came walking over to me and was all smiles, asking about how I was and what I was still doing at the company, etc, etc. It was at this point too that one of my co-workers mentioned about how I was off to China soon. Leon seized on that and started talking about his friend who was also interested in TEFL. But his interest seemed genuine, so I got to talking about how I got my TEFL qualification, who I got it through, what company that I was going to be working for out in China, stuff like that. We must have chatted for about 20 minutes, and he wrote down some details for his friend, and then went off to work. At the end of the day, I was packing all of my stuff to leave, and a few of my co-workers were coming over to say their goodbyes. Don't get me wrong, the Leon incident aside, I had a wonderful time working at that company and I made a lot of great friends. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Leon approaching, but I just think to myself, what's the harm? I mean, I'm going to China. He says goodbye and wishes me luck on my new adventure. But then, as I'm literally walking out the door of the department, I hear him call out to me. Hey, I'll see you in China. For the first two weeks of my teacher training over there, I was like a complete hawk, keeping a constant lookout for this guy. He never did seem to follow me out to China, which I'm very grateful for, but it still remains one of the creepiest encounters that I've ever had with anyone. It was around 92 and I was still in high school in semi-rural Tennessee. With Halloween coming in a few days, my friends and I wanted to do something fun and one suggested that we have a campfire on Black Mountain. I'd moved to the area a few years before and I'd never heard of it but it wasn't too far and supposed to be spooky. So a little before dark we gather our various campfire foods and other supplies and we head off. It's a narrow dirt road peppered with gravel wound up the side, and we made our fire at a small turn-off part of the way up. As the sun goes down, we start telling various scary stories and doing all the Halloween fun stuff. A few tales were around Black Mountain itself. There was apparently a community that was cursed by native spirits with fire, disease, and other awful things. A mother and a daughter had been murdered, and their ghosts could sometimes be seen walking along the road. There were also stories about devil worshippers and witches who practiced their dark magics at the top. Time passes. It's about 10 in the evening now and we're enjoying the night. When all of a sudden we hear engines approaching. We're thinking that it's got to be some friends arriving late or something. So we all get up and take a look. Our fire was about 20 feet from the road I would guess. And as the sound gets closer, one of us notices the lack of headlights. That seems weird, but maybe it's just someone messing with us? In the darkness, we then watch a, a line of cars creep slowly past. Hard to tell for sure, but there were at least five, and not one of them had their headlights on. All we could see was the light of the fire reflected off their windows through the trees. And 
I knew that they were observing us as intently as we were then, but it was super weird and dangerous too. I mean, driving up the side of this mountain with no headlights on, that's crazy. Anyway, we waited until we could no longer hear them before deciding what to do. One friend wanted to go and check it out, but the rest of us, we vetoed that idea pretty quickly. I may have been a dumb teen, but I'd watched enough horror movies at this point to know that whatever was going on up there, I wanted no part of it. We ended up dousing our fire, packed up our stuff, and we headed home. Like I said, I still have no idea what these people were up to, but driving up the mountain with no headlights, that's a sure sign that you're trying to hide, right? I guess the question is, what were five vehicles, possibly more, heading up in a convoy to the top of the mountain, trying to hide from? So, I wanted to share this because, well, I guess I would like some advice. You see, every single night for the past week or more, my boyfriend and I have noticed a car parked in the parking lot next door that faces our bedroom window. Usually, too, the person just sits in the vehicle for a few minutes and drives away. Though, a couple of nights they sat there for about an hour. They don't appear to be on their phone as there's no light, but you can make out their face and a couple of times my boyfriend has said that he thinks that he can see them looking at us. But we do keep the room pitch black and we live in an apartment building so it's pretty difficult for them to be looking through our windows. It's always around 3am though and the car is never there at any other time. In fact, another vehicle is usually there and we remember it because there was this weird incident where a man walked up to this vehicle with someone in the driver's seat and proceeded to spray paint all of the windows, then walked away just about a month or so ago. I don't know if the two things are related, but who knows, right? Does anyone have any idea as to why this person would be doing this? Why are they just sitting there looking in the apartments? and every night at the same time too. I'm beginning to get a bit weirded out by this and I'll keep you guys posted if anything else happens, but what do you guys think? I was about 10 and staying with my grandma, something that I did and loved for a week every holidays. My grandma lived in a new suburb on the outskirts of our city because it was new, there were a lot of new immigrants who started to move in there. There was a wave of immigration from Lebanon due to the war there, asylum seekers mainly. This was back in the days when it was a very white Australia, so my 10 year old self found these people sort of strange with their different clothes and stuff like that. Anyway, I was sort of playing by myself, sort of playing with these new kids in the church parking lot down the road from my grandma's. I was the only blonde Anglo out of 20 kids of all ages, 2 years to 12 years, and I think that that's why I may have been singled out, because I really stood out. So, this girl about my age was sort of trying to play with me. She was so foreign to me with her hijab and long black dress in 40 degree Aussie summer that I blurted out to her, why are you wearing such an ugly dress? Because I was raised by very compassionate parents, my shame rose up on me pretty immediately. But no more than when I looked around to see if anyone heard me, there stood a man just staring at me. I thought at the time that he heard me and I was really ashamed and thought that maybe he came over to speak to me about being mean to this girl. Or maybe to tell my grandma or worse, maybe even ring my parents. I was 10 and believed that all adults had a line to each other at the time. I now realize that he wasn't even close enough to hear me. But my 10 year old head at the time thought that him watching me from over 10 meters away, sort of behind a tree for over 2 to 3 hours, was because he was deciding how to punish me for my crime. Anyway, it started to get dark, everyone started to disperse for bath and dinner and bed. I got up and started to walk back. The man started to follow me. He followed me to my grandma's and I ran inside and shut and locked the door immediately. I was actually waiting for his knocks to tell my grandma my crime, but instead, nothing came. 
queue, I thought. He must have changed his mind. But as I took a sneak peek out the window, I saw him go down the side of the house. All I could think was, oh no, he's going to come in the back door to tell her. The shame. But again, nothing. Okay, thank God. Just as I was going to bed, I looked out my back window and there he was. Smoking, standing under the clothesline. Still weighing up whether to tell my grandma or not. I kept taking sneak peeks and he was still there till I fell asleep. And the next day, my grandma said that my bedroom fly screen and my bathroom fly screen was off their windows. And that I must have done it because they couldn't just fall off. She also said that I wasn't to try and force my window open if it sticks next time. Because all the window around the window was all chipped up and broken. I told her that no, I didn't do it. But she didn't believe me. She wasn't a, a crotchety grandma though, so she let it go. And you know, for the longest time, I just never really connected that it must have been the man trying to get in. Because it was my window and my bathroom window too. In my head, he was just there to speak to my grandma. So at the time, there was just no connection. I never actually thought of him again as well until just last week. I'm an aware adult now and I think that I just realized close I may have come to oh who knows what I grew up in Ohio in the 70s and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside pretty much all the time that we could manage Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest and my parents would drop me off in the morning and we'd stay in the woods pretty much all weekend We'd only come out for school, and we loved pretending that we were frontiersmen. But we would build shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we actually got this notion to pull a Stand By Me. This was based on the movie of the same name that had just come out. The idea was that we would walk the railroad tracks out in the country, but instead of looking for a dead body, we'd find cool bridges to fish from and camp a little ways off the tracks. Of course, we knew that this was dangerous and we'd likely be trespassing even, but we were kids and stupid. But we actually had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers and we discovered bridges that no one went to. We fished, we hid from trains, and at night we camped in the woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. But nothing bad ever really happened. In fact, it was pretty idyllic. It was so much fun that we did it multiple times never had a problem. After high school though, me and Joe went our own ways. We both left home but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so that we'd see each other occasionally. And well, one summer in the mid-90s, it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. We'd do stuff with the family in the day and at night we'd either catch drinks at a bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. But one night, me and Joe got to talking about our Stand By Me trips. And well, nostalgia and beer are a heck of a mix, right? And soon we decided to take a day and walk the trails, camp one night and walk home. The day came and we started out early morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot where we used to start, right outside of our hometown. She thought that this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. But when she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we take the opposite direction, just to be adventurous. But we knew the land well, we had a map, so I gave her, yeah, what the heck, and off we set. The day went fine, it was fun and a little sad too, but in a good way. But we found a bridge and sat on the edge, smoked a bit, and then we moved on. But we had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and some other stuff. Before night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area, trees on every side of the train track, so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had brought some small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little bit of scouting of the perimeter. Now, this is what we used to do in the old days too. But we'd walk around the area a little bit to make sure that some dude's house wasn't just over the hill and we were actually camping in the yard or something. We walked maybe a... 
I would say a hundred or so feet into the woods and up a small incline. We figured that if we didn't see anything from on top of this short hill that we'd be fine. But when we got to the top we saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible but we could definitely see it. We pondered over what to do and we both assumed that it was probably just a sugar shack or something because there didn't appear to be a clear road into it. From where we were there didn't look to be anyone in it either. All was quiet, but no movement could be seen, and no lights. So, but we decided to walk a little closer, just to make sure. We came down the hill pretty slowly, and as we neared the building, we saw that it wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was a, an old church by the looks of it. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a, a squat, sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stood on top of the place, also weathered in black. None of the windows had glass and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough though to see inside. There were rows of pews and a built-up section in front for a preacher to stand on. We didn't go all the way in, we really didn't want to. Beyond all that though, there was no sign of anyone else. There were no footprints, no paths, no roads. It was an abandoned church. We left immediately though and we went back up the hill to our spot that we had picked to camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better but we were still a little bit uneasy I'll admit. We chalked it up to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at this point it was dusk and we just decided to rig out our hammocks and go to sleep and move on at early morning. Night set in and as we lay in our hammocks and shot the breeze, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. And our conversation about it went a little like this. Hey, uh, do you hear that? Yeah, what is that? It kind of sounds like uh, maybe people singing? And it did sound just like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two and the singing continued, but it wasn't getting loud. Finally, we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move pretty quietly in the woods, based on the old days and all of our work there. It was honestly kind of second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided just enough light so that you wouldn't walk right into a tree or something. But it was near pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill, and we didn't talk. But when we got to the top, we saw a light in the distance, and it was coming from that church, and the singing was coming from inside as well. Joe and I put our heads close together, and we had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, can you believe this? The light looked to be a candlelight from the way it flickered, and though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but maybe in another language? We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there, but we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intentions of getting closer either. We had about a football field between us, and we had to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then it just stopped. After that, a, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared me. It sounded like some sort of a... An Old Testament preacher you see in the movies, but again, it was like he was speaking in a different language because we couldn't understand a single word that he was saying. Eventually, it got to where the single male voice would say something and then a bunch of voices would answer in the song. This lasted for a while as well, and then they all broke into this long but sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears and... Then it just stopped. At this point, I was getting ready to say, hey man, let's get out of here, when Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, shh, they're coming out, man. We were far enough away that we couldn't make them out really well, but what we could see was a line of figures walk out the open doorway, all holding hands in a single file. We could see some of them had flashlights and they began to sing again and the light from the flashlights began to move toward us and the hill. 
As soon as we saw that, we booked it back to our campsite, grabbed our stuff, and we ran straight to the tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction that we had come from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back, and we saw lights coming down the hill. But they were moving sort of erratically, like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road. By our map, we knew that a small town was about 15 minutes down it, and we walked there, got to a 24-hour gas station, and called my wife to come and get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was kids messing around. But I heard those voices, and they sure as heck didn't sound like kids to me. I'm not really sure who those people were, but it was definitely the creepiest thing that's happened to me out in the woods. This happened a few years back when I was an undergrad. I attended a school that is several hundred years old, like before United States was an independent country old. And as such, a lot of the campus and the surrounding town are reportedly haunted. In my freshman year, I lived in one of the oldest dorms in the campus. I had heard stories of various hauntings since before I applied, but I never expected anything to actually happen to me. But a few weeks into the semester, things started happening. The closet doors would just fly open. Books would fall off desks. Posters would fall off the wall continuously. That sort of thing. It was infrequent at first, but as the weeks went on, it got so frequent and brazen that Jim, as we called him, would move things several times a week and start waking us up in the middle of the night. My roommate and I were understandably unnerved, but... We didn't know for sure that it was a, a ghost. I mean, we never actually saw things move. We were always at computers or desks and just looking somewhere else, so we only saw the aftermath. And so we decided to try and gather some proof. We bought a camera and we set it up to where we would have a view of the whole room. We had it there for over a week and in that span, nothing happened. My roommate got frustrated and turned off the camera one night. That very same night, we woke up to a crash and saw the camera had fallen off the dresser and broken, which meant that he had waited for us to turn the camera off. And we were certain at that moment that we definitely had a third roommate with us. After that, things kind of calmed down for a bit. The things still moved, but only every couple of weeks now and very rarely at night. The next year too, we talked to the people who lived in the room now and they said that they were experiencing the same kind of things. And so we know that it wasn't just us imagining things. I grew up in the Midwest US. When I was a senior in high school, I was out for a hike at a local trail in the National Forest. This was a good 20 miles from town, way out in the sticks. It's a box canyon, so you sort of start at the rim and hike down into the canyon. It was autumn and late afternoon when I pulled into the empty parking area, but there was plenty of light still. By the time that I got to the bottom of the canyon, the sun was getting pretty low. I was down in the canyon and got that feeling that something just wasn't right. I started looking behind me as I walked every few steps because I just couldn't shake this feeling. Finally though, on one of these backward glances, I spotted a man picking up from behind a tree. Not far at all, maybe a hundred feet away if I had to guess. It was the, the weirdest thing too to catch a guy watching me out in the middle of nowhere. He knew that I'd seen him though and stepped out saying, sorry I didn't want to scare you. He was an adult man, I was a scrawny 17 year old kid. We were on the trail in a public park where there was really no reason to hide. I wouldn't have been surprised or even alarmed to have seen another hiker there in fact, unless they were acting like a creep like this guy was. I mumbled something about getting back to my car and started to head back toward the parking area, leaving him standing there. As soon as I got out of view though, I ran all the way back to the parking area where there were no cars other than mine, which obviously added to the weirdness. 
I realize that it's entirely possible that he was on foot and possibly lived near the trailhead or something, as there were houses out there, but it's interesting how you just get that sensation when you're being watched, and it often turns out to be true like that. I don't know what he was doing following me, though, but that's the weird part, I guess. I guess the moral of the story, though, is that if you see someone hiking alone, try not to be a creep. So, this happened when I was 19, and in the summertime. I'm 30 now. I had just gotten into my first serious relationship with a girl, and because of that, I was constantly hanging out at her place, as her mum worked at a retail store late at night. I would generally go over on her mum's super late shift, so that she wouldn't be home alone, which her mum actually appreciated, as they lived out in a new development, and because of that, people would generally break into houses being built to steal copper pipes and lumber and work gear or stuff like that. Or just burglarize new homes, period. Anyway, on this particular night, her mum had gotten back at around 3 or 4 and I had the next day off of work. We hadn't been drinking and no smoking or any drugs of any kind, just sort of hanging out. But once her mum got home, I needed to head back home and... I was living with my parents at the time as I had just started college. When I finally got home, I noticed that the blinds in our dining room were open, which my parents hated. To give you a rough layout of the house though, when you first walk in, there's a, a big hall that runs from the front door to the back door or the living room. In the middle of this hall, you find a dining room to the right with a giant window that overlooks like the street to the right of the house. It's actually a corner house. And to the left is a big straight staircase that leads to my parents' bedroom and the other two rooms. When the blinds are open in the dining room at night, this giant street light shines the brightness of a thousand suns and goes straight into my parents' bedroom. And is really annoying for them as their bed gets all of the light. My dad told me that if I ever stayed up late or came home late to be sure that the blinds were closed. Otherwise, there would be trouble as he would have to wake up and go downstairs and close them and he works early, and I mean really early in the morning. They almost always sleep with the door open too, which is another point. Anyway, so I had gotten home and noticed the blinds were open like I said. I walked into the dining room and saw the silhouette of a person standing in front of the blinds and I assumed it was my dad. I quickly start apologizing that I forgot to close them and I hear nothing and see this silhouette move across the window towards the opposite end of the window where the light switch is. I call out my dad's name once more and I get no answer and then I get this horrible, horrible feeling of just dread and immediately beat this shadow silhouette to the punch and flick the light switch, turning the overhead lights on. And there was nothing absolutely nothing. I immediately get sick to my stomach with fear, slam the blinds closed and I ran to my bedroom. I bring this up to my family the next morning at breakfast and one by one my family all admits to have seen the same thing at some point in the past month or two. But without going into too much detail, the gist is that we had all seen this shadow but didn't really tell anyone as we assumed it was just us being tired, still waking up from sleep or something else. But the following things had allegedly happened. So my brother had gotten home from a graveyard shift and grabbed some dinner from the fridge, headed upstairs to his bedroom which was next to my parents. He didn't want to wake my parents from the staircase light. He was looking down so he didn't trip on the stairs and then he walked into something. He assumed it was my dad as it was barefoot, but he said the feet were ink black. And when he looked up, he saw nothing. He ran upstairs after that, slammed his door and ate his dinner and then just went to bed in terror. My sister, who was maybe 10 at the time, woke up from a shadow sitting on her bed. She said that she thought it was my dad and when she called out dad, she got no answer. This scared her so bad that she grabbed the flashlight on a nightstand, which oddly enough was given to her by my dad to fight ghosts. Turned it on and nothing. After that, she said that she ran to my mum, but that it was chalked up to just a bad dream. My mum had actually woken up in the middle of the night one night and saw a shadow in the corner of their bedroom 
sitting on a large high back chair that my dad sits on to read sometimes or do work on his laptop. She walked up to the chair to tell him to go to bed, and when he didn't reply, she turned around and saw my dad was sleeping in the bed still, and she looked back and the figure in the chair was now gone. And lastly, my father, who again works really early, got to his office at work. He's always the first one there as he's the big boss man. He starts walking around his office, turning the lights on, and I noticed a shadowy figure in one of the halls where his employees worked. Being someone who doesn't really mess around with people potentially breaking into either his workplace or his house, he ran towards it calling it out and said that it just darted down a hallway that had only one exit, an emergency exit that would have set off an alarm, and he never saw it. He never brought this up for reasons that I'm not really sure, but I know that he's not really a believer of the paranormal or anything, but I do know that that's one of the few things that he finds in his own words as odd. After all of this though, my mum had called our local Catholic priest to come and bless the house, and we never saw that shadow thing again after that. I'm not sure why, but I do know that the one thing that we all felt was the way it looked. I can still sort of picture it in my head as well. It was definitely male, tall and thin and broad shoulders. I don't know how my parents felt when they were near it, but I always felt sick and sort of terrified and just overall dread. Anyway, so that's my story and... You can choose to believe me if you want to or not, but I swear to you that everything that I've just said is 100% truth. So I applied on a job website recently for a serving position at a restaurant. I was contacted by someone through the messaging option through the site. The place was a, a Burmese restaurant. I ended up googling the address and found where it was. The next day the person messaging me told me an address that didn't show up on Google. I thought it was odd but oh well. Today the interview was at 9am. The restaurant being open this early was surprising to me I must admit. I use Google Maps and find the location though. I'm always early and boy am I glad that I was. The location was not even open for business. The paper on the door said that the restaurant is opening in April and it had a completely different name than the ad had stated. I looked inside and the building looked abandoned and was also really dilapidated. Okay, pretty weird I'll admit. I stand off to the side to scope because I'm having a very very bad feeling that this may be some sort of a setup trap to lure a person or a girl like me into a place for an attack. And then I notice... Uh, man who looks to be high on a stimulant, wearing nice clothing, just sort of watching me. He smiles and laughs and then does this bird whistle and goes to the side of the restaurant. A few minutes later, a man in an Audi SUV shows up, looks at me, starts laughing and meets up with the first guy. They're both around the side and I start wondering if there is a door to get in that way that I didn't know about. I start hearing the men bird whistling and, to my terror, I hear multiple other bird whistles coming from all around the block, but I don't see any. How many people are out there and why are they hiding like this? I get freaked out. I was going to tell the interviewer to do the interview outside because if I get locked in there, I know that I'm stuck. But in the end, I ended up trusting my intuition and I just got out of there. Nothing bad happened luckily because I decided to trust my gut. But I just wanted to share this because I'm really unsure as to what to do next. Because, well, nothing really happened. I don't know really how to approach this without technical evidence or something at least to give the cops. I want to contact the job website or police to look into it but I just feel like they're not really going to care. This encounter was about two years ago when my two older cousins came to visit me. I have a decent sized house with a very long hallway. It's about three o'clock around the time that I wake up and I really needed to use the bathroom so I get up and slowly walk my way to the bathroom. 
And when I do, I hear talking in the living room and I'm thinking to myself, dang, mum and dad are still awake? Well, uh, I guess I'll go say goodnight one more time and tell them that I love them. So, as I finish using the bathroom, I start walking down my extremely long hallway. My grey cat blocks the hallway and she starts growling in a sort of low tone and turns and hisses towards the living room. I just shake it off because she always gets defensive when my cousins stay at my house. As I'm walking to the living room, I see it's really bright in there, like as if all the lights were on and they had flashlights or something. And then I hear some static, but I just thought that they had an error with a cable or something, but boy, was I very wrong. Because just as I pass my front door, I see three all-white static-like beings standing in front of the TV, just sort of staring at it. I stared in horror and I thought my mind was playing tricks on me. But without the static people noticing me, I grabbed my cat and ran back to my room and I locked the door. I don't know what those things were or what all of this is about, but no one seems to believe me about it. So, uh, I'm officially freaked out and have come to the conclusion that this saga surrounding my dog is no longer just innocent. I lived in the same apartment for five years from 2014 to 2019. Around Christmas of 2017, I left my apartment to find a cute dog collar on my doormat. It had tags on it still and was clearly new. I have a beautiful sweet Great Dane who frequented the apartment dog park with me, so I assumed that one of the people that we always play with got it for her. I kept it and used it, but never did find out who left it. Flash forward to sometime around my March birthday in 2018, a big bag of Sizzler's dog treats, my dog's favourite, were on my porch chair. I knew that I hadn't left them there. I thought again, well, that was really nice just someone doing the right thing but I'm sort of crazy protective of my dog so I actually threw the bag away since I didn't know their origin. Around August 2018 another surprise showed up on the porch this time a stuffed lamb chop toy a dog cookie like you get at the pet store and a small bag of my dog's food. Now at the time I fed my dog origin so even the small bag was really expensive and I thought that this was super weird. I began telling people at the office in the dog park and asking my neighbours if they'd seen anything. Nothing, and nobody else had any other experiences like it. Again though, I got a bag of treats around January of 2019. This time I was just fed up though, so I left a sign on my sliding glass door that said I appreciated the gesture, but to stop leaving gifts, and I put a second camera inside facing the patio as well. And nothing happened after that. Sometime around then though, I had left my dog's favourite stuffed toy dinosaur on my front door mat as we came in from the park because it was covered in mud. I went to get it later to clean it and it was just gone. I was sure that somebody threw it out since we had people that collected our trash from bins at the front door and I noticed that they had come by. But me and my dog moved into my fiancé's house about 50 minutes away in October of last year. I always thought it was just a weird neighbourhood kid or a shy person or an old person from the senior living place across the street or something and eventually I forgot about it. That is, until about an hour ago. So I came home on my break to eat, I worked third shift, and I let my dog and my fiancé's dog out the back when I noticed that on the stairs to the door, there's the dinosaur toy, still muddy and... It has the same ripped tail propped up against the glass. I immediately shut the dogs in the house and go and look around, but there's nothing. Keep in mind, I left at 11.50pm and there was no toy. I came home at around 3.45am and it was there. So in that short middle of the night time frame, someone jumped my 5 foot fence, it locks and was still locked, placed the toy and then just left. Not to mention, too, that they had to have found my new address, which is not listed anywhere, and I didn't leave forwarding addresses with the apartment complex. I put the toy in a trash bag, and it's in my garage now. I put a call into the non-emergency police line, and they said that they'd send someone today to take a report, but I can tell you that 
I'm officially freaked out now. I'm not letting my dog out of my sight. Update. So uh, I wanted to let everyone know that I have eight cameras on the way from Amazon that will arrive tomorrow and I'll set it up as soon as they get here. I also have our indoor Arlo camera that we usually use to check on the dogs when we're gone facing out from my front window towards the driveway with the motion detector on for now. I've also informed every neighbor that I have, I've talked to the police and I've let all my friends and family know. I also scoured my backyard for any weird treats or footprints and I didn't find anything. My neighbor actually had some old barbed wire in his shed as well, so he helped me put a strip of it along the inside top of my fence so that if someone reached up and tried to climb over, that they wouldn't see it, but they sure as heck would feel it. I also have a shotgun next to my bed with me, not loaded obviously, but it's the pump kind that makes a very loud, distinct and scary noise. I also check the toy thoroughly by cutting it open to check for wires or cameras or anything, and I even used a magnet to find any metal in the stuffing, and it was clean. I'm keeping it in the bag in the garage in case anything happens though, and uh, I guess I just want to thank you guys for your help to try and figure out who this person is and what they could be up to. I'll also continue to update you guys if anything happens. Update. So, some good news guys. The cameras that I got fully worked. Last night at around 9pm, a truck pulled up into my driveway and slowly backs out and turns around once my new driveway spotlight comes on. It's caught on my new blink camera and looking at the video, I actually recognized the truck instantly. It was the maintenance tech guy from my old apartment complex. He had a beat up black extended cab truck for as long as I lived there and the tailgate was completely missing and had one white panel on the back where it had been repaired or something. I know that he lived or lives at the complex, so there's probably no reason for the coincidence. But I instantly called the detective who I spoke with and told him, and they told me that they would go and speak with him today. Now, I've got to say though that I kind of feel a, a bit sad about this. This guy was always just super nice to me and my dog, and I knew from conversations with him and the office ladies that he has decreased mental capacity since birth and that he's slow with very little social skills. I don't think that he was trying to be malicious at all, but I'm pretty torn up about it, honestly. I had so many interactions with him over the time that I lived there, and all were so pleasant, and I knew that he had very little social skills. He once told me, in fact, that I was the one and only nice person to him there. I sort of know that that's probably true as well, because... I heard many residents complain about the retard maintenance guy and how they should get better for what they pay. And he loved my dog, always made it a habit to stop and pet her and whatnot. I told the detective all of this and that he was slow when I called, but uh, I don't know, I just feel very conflicted. What do you guys think? Update. So, the detective just gave me a call, guys. He sent an officer to talk to the guy at the complex. At first, he said he didn't know what they were talking about, but then after being showed the video evidence, said that he just turned around in the driveway and had no idea who it was, that he was just driving around. He also denied leaving any gifts ever. The detective said, too, that he had a clean background and that they couldn't get him on any charges and yada, yada, yada. I guess that I uh, don't feel as bad after he denied everything. I'm going to stay vigilant for sure, but I guess at least now he knows that I have cameras and that I'm watching. A little bit of backstory first. So I had just finished high school and had recently turned 18 when all of this occurred. I was looking forward to starting university and was going to be moving out of my parents' house into student housing closer to campus. As a result, I started looking for a job closer to my residence. I found one about five minutes walk from where I was going to be living and it was honestly perfect for me. I was to be a barista in a tiny little coffee kiosk in one of the coolest streets in the city. This street was uh, sort of known for prostitution and drugs, but it was also super popular as it hosted some of the most interesting events and also contained some of the nicest thrift stores in the city. But what was even more ideal about my new job, though, was the fact that I walked right across the road from my best friend, and her name was Phoebe. At the time, Phoebe was in love with her job, 
She was actively being given more responsibilities and she was being promised the world by her employers. Many of these promises turned out to be false at the time, but uh, that's another story. So, during one of her shifts though, Phoebe was approached by a man who had seemingly become a regular at the place that she was working, and his name was Richard. He told her that if she ever wanted to leave a job, he had just become the manager of a new restaurant, a little ways down the road, and Phoebe kindly denied his offer. He approached her several more times with this same offer before she recommended him, our other close friend. Her name was Mia. Mia was sort of uh, hesitant to take the position at first because she has a passionate hatred for hospitality and greatly prefers retail, but she did need the extra money at the time and so she ended up taking the job. The day that Mia was signing a contract too, Phoebe and I both finished work early, around 4, so we told Mia that we would meet her at a new job once we finished and that we would go do something afterwards. Phoebe and I went to the cake shop next door and sat outside at work while we waited for Mia. And when they finished, Richard followed Mia outside to come and say hello to Phoebe. The girls introduced him to me and the conversations ensued. And he honestly seemed like a pretty friendly guy, if not a little bit awkward. He was late 30s, early 40s, bird-like in appearance, quite short, balding, larger in size, and he seemed really greasy if... That's the right way to put it. As the conversation continued though, I began to tease Mia a little bit, as friends do. I saw no harm in it, as she was one of my best friends and she had made a similar joke at my expense prior to this interaction. But Richard's demeanor suddenly seemed to sort of just switch. He became somewhat catty in defense of Mia. He retorted back that if I was going to be mean to his staff that he would bar me from every store in the street that he worked on. This seemed ridiculous, but he claimed to be friends with a security guard that worked on the street. Fortunately, I was actually friends with this man too, and when I asked him about it, he told me that he'd never heard of a Richard before. Richard said these things to me as though he was joking, but he was so persistent about it that I got incredibly uncomfortable and honestly was almost in tears at one point. It was from this interaction too that he nicknamed me Trouble. I also feel it needs to be noted that he didn't scold me or Phoebe at all for the same behavior. Phoebe sensed my discomfort though and told him that we had to leave as we had plans. A flash forward a few weeks though and Phoebe and I decided to go to see Mia at work again. Richard intrudes our conversation yet again and again he singles me out from the group, teasing me and only referring to me as Trouble. This time I just sort of play along as I can tell it isn't going to stop. He asks me if she's after another job as he needs someone to clean his home and lives all the way out where my parents and Mia live. But Mia tells him that she can't as she has too many responsibilities. But I tell him that I might know a few people in the area that might do it and I give him my phone number. But Richard takes this as a sign that I've agreed to do it and begins texting me insistently about setting up a meeting. Now, this man is much older than me and lives alone in a rural area, so suddenly my instincts kicked in and I try to get out of it by telling him that I can't drive, but he says that he can pick me up from the nearest train station. Now, I know that this might sound silly, but I don't want to come across as impolite or have my best friend's boss resent her because of me, so I make the mistake of agreeing. However, I tell him that my sister will be helping me as she's looking for a part-time job and my dad will be dropping me off. I do this in order to have some backup and so that my dad knows my whereabouts. But Richard goes on to complain about how I don't trust him and claims that his house is very small and the hundred dollars he's going to pay me won't be enough to split with my sister. I tell him though that I just want to provide her with some work experience and finally he agrees asking how old she is but my sister is 17. Richard and I finally find a time though that I'm not working to schedule a meeting. This meeting is held at his place of work and I feel a lot more comfortable sitting in the main restaurant surrounded by people as I thought that he was going to hold a meeting in an office. We begin talking about the responsibilities of the job. He tells me that it'll be basic things like tidying up, vacuuming, the usual stuff. I agree and he then goes on to tell me how he'll also be expecting me to do his laundry. I think that this is a little bit odd as he's only paying a small amount for such a large job. 
but he assures me that his house is small and that it's not messy, but continuously claims it just needs a woman's touch. I nod and ignore the fact that this grown man thinks that just because he's a man, it means that he doesn't need to know how to maintain his own home, which in hindsight is weird, I know. But this is where things start to get a, a little creepy. So near the end of the meeting, he asks me again how old my sister is, and when I say 17, his face drops. He then starts telling me about how he previously posted this ad on Craigslist, and this 60-year-old woman replied offering to do it in her lingerie. He tells me how he didn't even ask for that in the ad, but she offered and he was put off completely. He then proceeds to tell me that he would be willing to pay more to someone between the ages of 18 to 30, if they're willing to do that, but... He would never request that because, well, he's not a pervert. I called him out on this one and tell him then and there that this meeting is done and I have to go and get feet. He asks if he made me uncomfortable, and yes, he did, but I just say no and that I'll get back to it. This strange man, who I've only met three times, remember, then attempts to hug me, but I ignore the gesture and awkwardly wave goodbye from less than three feet away. I boost it down the street toward Phoebe's work and tell her the whole story. She tells me that I can't do it, and I tell her that I know that, but I don't know how to tell him without risking my own safety or Mia's job. But fortunately, Richard gives me the perfect out, and he texts me later that afternoon telling me that he hopes I'm okay with the cats because, well, he has a small one. And I see this as the perfect opportunity, and lie and tell him that my sister and I are both deathly allergic to cats and neither of us will be open to doing the job now. But Richard accepts this reasoning after a little persuasion, and I think that I'm finally done with him. But unfortunately, that was definitely not the case. Richard proceeded to text me every day, asking if I'm mad at him or if he made me uncomfortable, asking me how my day was and stuff like that. Just behaving like a preteen in a new relationship, basically. And the more I ignored him, the more that he texted. I finally blocked him in March of 2019. This escapade had begun four or five months prior to this. The blocking still didn't stop him though. Mia informed me that Richard was no longer going to be working there as he had to go for surgery and we wouldn't have to see him anymore. See, Richard had not only been harassing me, but Mia and Phoebe too, just to a, a lesser extent. One Saturday morning while I was working, setting up at around 7.45 in the morning, Richard actually showed up at my work. The divider was down as we were closed, so he came and stood in the doorway, the only exit that I had available to me at the time. He started asking me why I was ignoring him and telling me about his surgery. I told him that he wasn't allowed to stand there as it was a fire exit, but he didn't budge. Fortunately, though, my boss showed up shortly after and told Richard that he was going to phone the security if he didn't move. Recognizing the sheer look of fear on my face as well, my boss was sort of a jerk on most days, but man, was I grateful for him that morning. Now, roughly a month after that experience, I honestly thought that Richard was gone from my life. I was living in my new apartment, Mia was around all the time and loved her job without Richard there, but things were going pretty well for us. One morning though, after a night of drinking, me and the flatmates became peckish. I decided to order her some greasy food from a delivery app, and lo and behold, it was our delivery driver other than Richard. I turn to my boyfriend at the time and tell him that he has to go and collect the food. He doesn't understand, but Mia assures him that it's really important. So he agrees and goes out to collect it. But Richard is not driving the vehicle that he claims to be driving on the app, and at first we're sort of confused as the number plate is also different. Mia and I watch from his bedroom window, and the interaction takes much longer than expected. He comes back, though, and we ask what took him so long. He tells us that Richard apparently refused to give him the food until he could prove that he was my boyfriend. Apparently, he recognized my name from the app, and now he knew where I lived, which was definitely a concern. But Mia and I tell my flatmates the story of what happened, and we all agree it's a good idea to go to my RA. The RA reports it to upper management, and they say that they can't really do anything about it, but if he does come in again to call their security. A few months go by, and there's no more Richard sightings, until I order from the same app again. And yet again, Richard is our driver. 
also in a different car again. So I send my boyfriend to go and collect the food again and report the incident to my RA again and the food delivery app. I know that I was stupid in not immediately reporting it to campus security as I had much more proof of the creepy behaviour than he had of his innocence, but I was naive and I didn't want my parents to find out at the time, so I just didn't do it. Fortunately, I haven't seen Richard since then, but what do you guys think? Do you think it was just a, a mere coincidence that he ended up being our delivery driver? Or do you guys think that there's more to this? I went to high school in a small Minnesota town, mostly farmland intersected by wood areas, and of course dozens of small lakes. One side of my neighborhood was bordered by a relatively large marshland that you could access by a slope that wound down to a trail. This trail curved through the marsh into a big patch of woods about uh, three quarters of a mile away. In the fall and the springtime after heavy rains, a fog would often settle over the marsh as it was so much lower than the surrounding area, and it truly looked like something out of a Stephen King novel, let me tell you. Anyway, after one of these rains, my brother and I, he was probably 13 and I was 16, decided that it would be a great idea to go explore the woods in the fog. Although the sun was setting fast, we knew that we could make it to the woods in about 10 minutes if we left immediately. We grabbed a couple of flashlights, knowing that it was probably going to be dark by the time that we got home, and we headed for the trail. Once we were in the trail and moving, it sort of hit us just how thick the fog was. We had only been walking for a minute or two, but we had absolutely no visibility behind us and five or ten feet max in front of us. We continued walking for a few more minutes, just sort of messing around about hearing noises and seeing red eyes in the distance the whole time, until we came to a curve in the trail. This particular curve signaled that we were only about a hundred yards from the entrance to the woods. And at this point, there's a small lake on the left side of the trail and miles of marshland on the right. It's important to note that we've moved farther and farther away from any houses. Our house was the closest to the trail and the trail moved far away from our neighborhood rather than bordering any backyards. But we began walking past the lake and then we heard a splash. Definitely larger than a fish jumping as well, but we had no idea what else would have been out there to make that noise. So we just sort of stopped waited, and upon hearing nothing else, just continued on our way. We couldn't have been going for more than 15 seconds when we heard cracking and shuffling in the brush up ahead to our left. We stopped dead in our tracks and waited, and then at the end of our eyesight, which could have only been about 10 feet away, a figure stepped out from the brush bordering the lake. The fog was way too thick to make out many details, but it must have been at least 6 foot 4, and very broad-shouldered. As the figure made its way into the middle of the trail, my brother gasped and then it stopped. Its head shot over and looked right at us and just sort of stared. It felt like an eternity, but it couldn't have been more than a few seconds. And I don't know why, but I felt true terror in that moment, and I've never replicated that feeling again. I began to take a small step backwards, and suddenly, the figure took off running into the marshland. And when I say quickly, I mean, there's nothing on this planet that can move that quickly. Again, there are no houses or buildings or anything for miles in the direction that it ran as well. But suffice it to say, my brother and I sprinted back to the house faster than we've ever run. I still don't know what, or perhaps even who, I saw that day. But to be honest... I kind of hope that I never do. So some friends and I used to drink in this really old, abandoned, dilapidated farmhouse that was about a half an hour walk out of our hometown. It was a place that we could just drink and chill all night and not have to worry about cops and stuff like that. Although the house itself was a bit dangerous, I'll admit. It was ready to collapse for sure, but we didn't mind. We always sat on the top floor as it had the least amount of debris and had a nice wide open area where we could all sit in a circle. We'd bring a flashlight, but we'd turn it off once we got up in our little area upstairs, just in case someone happened to drive by and notice something suspicious might be happening. Although, not even once did a car drive by, like ever, on any night that we were there. 
And if they did, it would have been very noticeable, as it was miles away from any light sources and was dead quiet, other than the crickets chirping. But anyway, one night, I'm pretty sure it was a Saturday, probably around 2 or 3 in the morning or so, a group of 7 or 8 of us, we hear the door open and some chatter. We're like, oh no, and quickly hit our booze, sat as still and quiet as we could and hoped that they just wouldn't come upstairs. But they did. But this is where it gets really weird. Now, although it was dark with no lights, we could easily see each other across the room. And this Hutterite family, they're sort of like the Amish folk, all basically wear the same style of clothes and live in colonies and farms, that comes walking up the stairs. They were chatting to each other, but it wasn't in English. I think it might have been German maybe, but... I really can't say, except the two little girls, I would guess around six or seven, they were speaking in English to each other. They came into the open room that we were in and started looking around. We were basically soiling our pants at this point. I mean, there's no way that they wouldn't be able to see us all just sitting there in a circle. But somehow, they didn't. In fact, they sort of looked right at us, but through us. Like, we didn't even exist. In fact, at one point, one of the little girls was standing right in front of me, and she said excitedly, this is going to be my bedroom. We were all just sort of sitting there frozen solid, looking at each other like, is this really happening? They continued to kind of just walk around and look at stuff. It seemed like they were checking out a new house that they were going to move into or something. But if you saw the state of this house, then you would know 100% that this was never going to be the case. It was way beyond repair of any stage. But they walked around for like 10 minutes just sort of chatting away, seemingly completely oblivious to us, and again, there is just no way that they wouldn't be able to see us. But finally, they walked back down the stairs. We heard the door open and shut, and then silence. No vehicle driving away, nothing, just crickets again. We were all like, what the heck just happened? Where did they even go? A few of us decide to quickly investigate, so we go down the stairs with our trusty flashlight, go outside, and there's just nothing. No vehicle, no tire tracks in the gravel road, no people, just nothing. Mind you, this wasn't even a minute after we heard the door shut, and if they were on foot, they wouldn't have made it that far. And this was flat open prairie grassland. You can see for miles in any direction. So we would have definitely been able to see them without a doubt. Key points too that make this event even stranger is that this house was miles away from any other house. There was no vehicle and it was like we weren't even there. We looked sketchy, seriously. We had mohawks, tattoos, piercings all over our faces, leather jackets with nails and stuff sticking out of them, etc. There's just no way that you wouldn't see us in the abandoned house at that time of night and just react in fear. Also, it was like 3 in the morning. Why the heck would you walk on foot with young children to come and check out a, an old dilapidated farmhouse at that time of night without even a flashlight? I really don't know what to think of it, to be honest. I mean, we all saw them and they were definitely there and they seemed real. That house is still there as well, but it's basically sideways now from the wind. There's no way anyone in their right mind was going to try and fix it up, let me tell you. And it's been over 20 years, and everyone who was there is still scratching their heads. My parents live next door to a small red house. Our backyard faces the side of their house, which has a deck and two large windows. Around front, there are always at least three cars parked outside. Oddly enough, in the ten years that I've lived there, I never saw anyone enter or leave as well. Once when I was twelve, I saw shadows thrown against the far wall that was visible through one of the windows, but that was about it. When my sister moved out, I took her bedroom, a large open converted space in the basement which had a door and an outdoor stairwell which led to the backyard. The door had a small window on it which my sister had covered with a, a Pulp Fiction poster. I redecorated and replaced the poster with some of those sheer half-curtain things. 
But the way the room was set up is that if I was laying on my bed or sitting on the couch, I was facing the door. When I first moved down there too, I noticed that sometimes at night, I would hear the sounds of leaves crunching in the stairwell. Initially, I chalked it up to my cat, who liked to roam the neighborhood, and I really had no reason to suspect otherwise. That is, until a few weeks later. So one night, when my parents were away on business, my boyfriend and I were sitting on the couch just smoking, and suddenly he got really stiff and was just staring at the window. I asked him what was wrong, and then he said, Uh, I think I just saw a camera flash. I kind of just laughed it off and ended up just chalking it up to him being high. I mean, who would want a picture of two people getting stoned? Still, the seeds of paranoia had been sown, and... It wasn't easy to get settled down for sleep that night. I kept looking at the gap between the curtains. There was no light at the bottom of the stairs, so if someone really was down there, I would be none the wiser. But at around three, I heard the distinct sound of leaves under heavy boots. Definitely not a cat this time. I don't know what made me decide the best course of action was for me, standing all of five foot three to confront a potential stalker myself. I didn't even put shoes on. But I threw the door open and there was no one in the stairwell. So I ran up the stairs and into the backyard. And standing there was a man in his mid-40s. Maybe six feet tall and wearing one of those mechanic jumpsuits. He was holding a, a clunky outdated digital camera. We stood there for a second just sort of looking at each other. He seemed confused to see me but... After what felt like a long time, I remembered how to speak, and I said, What are you doing? My voice seemed to startle him, and he immediately turned and ran through my backyard towards the red house and into the dark. After that, too, I didn't see any strange flashes of light or hear any crunchy leaf noises or anything. But it definitely really freaks me out to think about just how many nights he could have just been standing there in the dark, watching me. 